everyone, I'm Christy Dahl. I'm a senior climate scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to present to you today some of the research that my colleagues and I have done on extreme heat and how extreme heat is projected to change as our climate changes. The work I'll be talking about today is largely based on a report that my colleagues and I uh, researched and wrote um, last summer called Killer Heat in the United States. It covers the entire um, lower 48 of the US and we'll get to explore some of those results and what they might mean for our health in the future. For anyone who is not familiar with the Union of Concerned Scientists, I wanted to give just a very brief introduction of who we are. We are a national advocacy organization. We're a nonprofit and we aim to put science into action. So what that means is that we do independent, rigorous science that can help to inform public policy and public dialogue about some of the biggest problems that we face today in the world, including things like climate change. Uh, we're completely funded by uh, member donations and small foundations, so we don't take any money from industry or government, which really gives us the opportunity to do science that's very independent of those sorts of influences. So many of us have the perception that heat has become more and more of a problem in the US over the course of our lifetimes. You'll hear people say, you know, we used to have heat waves, but they weren't this bad, or gosh, I've never experienced heat like this in Florida before. It turns out that there's data to back up those perceptions that many of us have. This is a chart that comes from the most recent national climate assessment. And what we're looking at here are the, the ratio of daily record highs to daily record lows. So where you see red, there are more daily record highs in a given year than there are lows. And the size of that bar is the size of the proportion of those highs to lows. So what you can see is that over the course of the last 100 years or so, we've started to see many more daily record high temperatures than daily record low temperatures. That's a trend that we've particularly witnessed since about 1980 or so. Another recent study that looked at average conditions across 50 cities in the US found that by many metrics, heat waves are becoming more severe and more intense. For example, if we look at the frequency of heat waves since the 1960s, we can see that across these 50 cities, heat waves have become more frequent. They've also become more intense. And the length of the season in which we experience extreme heat has become longer. So that means that we're starting to see this heat not just in July and August, but into some of those shoulder seasons as well. Extreme heat already takes a toll on people's health and their lives. Um, last summer, during a heat wave that occurred in July across much of the eastern half of the US, um, an emergency room physician noted this, that they'd seen a huge spike in ER visits and admissions, they'd been admitting people left and right. And that's because heat exacerbates a lot of underlying conditions and can cause a lot of strain on our bodies, even on its own. So my colleagues and I saw that extreme heat is already causing a lot of problems for people in the US and around the world. And we know from um, published studies about climate change that extreme heat is set to get much worse in the future. So we wanted to explore what this looks like and what the possible futures could be so that people could see this sort of change coming and hopefully take action to put us on a safer course. So the report we published, as I mentioned, is called Killer Heat in the United States. Um, I'll show you a URL at the end, but you're welcome to look it up online. It's free to download and explore. What we did with this killer heat analysis was we took a set of very high resolution climate models. So these are sort of like um, uh, mathematical models that incorporate everything we know about our climate system and ask how that climate system would change with different um, greenhouse gas emission scenarios and different warming scenarios for the future. We used temperature and humidity data from those climate models 
to calculate the heat index, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next couple of slides. Um, and we looked at how the heat index would change over the next 100 years or so. We looked at three different scenarios for how our greenhouse gas emissions might evolve uh, between now and the end of the century. And then we aggregated the data so that we could provide information for every community, every county in the lower 48. So to back up for a moment, what is the heat index? Many of you are probably aware of what the heat index is. It's often called the feels like temperature by the National Weather Service. But what it is, is a combination of temperature and relative humidity that tries to reflect the fact that when it's humid, our bodies experience temperatures as being even hotter than the thermometer alone would suggest. And that's because our primary way of cooling our bodies is through sweating. And when there's a lot of humidity in the air, a lot of moisture in the air, our bodies don't sweat as efficiently. And so we tend to accumulate heat more easily in our bodies. So if we look at this um, chart, this is based on the National Weather Service chart. Um, you can see that for a temperature of about 90 degrees, if you have relatively low humidity, around 40%, the heat index would only be about 91. But if you have um, 90 degrees outside and 65% relative humidity, it's actually going to feel more like 103 degrees to your body. So we looked at different categories of heat index values in our study. And then we also looked at what we call off the charts conditions. So these, this is this area in the gray zone in this um, chart. And this is a zone that reflects the fact that our ability to calculate the heat index is based on historical conditions throughout the world. As we increasingly find ourselves outside of those historical norms, we put ourselves into this off the charts category. And in this category, the formulas that we use to calculate the heat index no longer return reliable values. Essentially, we can't calculate how hot it feels using a heat index. Um, if we get to a heat index, you know, generally around 135, 137 degrees. The way that our body responds to heat is going to vary from person to person. It depends on things like your underlying health, your age, whether you're on any medications, um, whether you have any respiratory conditions. But generally speaking, as the heat index rises, more and more people become susceptible to heat-related illnesses like heat stress or heat stroke. For example, with a heat index above about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when um, OSHA says that outdoor workers um, should start to take extra precautions against the heat. Um, with a heat index above 100, uh, the National Weather Service often warns that children, elderly adults, pregnant women, people with underlying conditions have a heightened risk of heat-related illness. With a heat index above about 105, anyone could be at risk of heat-related illness. And with those um, off-the-charts conditions, we really don't know how people will cope with those kinds of, of um, weather conditions because they've historically been very unprecedented but presumably they'd be extremely dangerous for all people um, and could result in heat-related illness or death. Heat affects our bodies in a number of different ways. Some of those ways are, you could consider just a minor nuisance, um, like a headache or some dizziness, but some of them are truly life-threatening, such as um, you know, reduced blood flow to the heart and heart attack. Um, many, many of the systems in our body are affected by heat. One of the more interesting and, uh, to me, effects as we were researching um, the effects of the heat on the body was that um, heat affects pregnant women in surprising ways. Um, we, the pregnant women who are exposed to extreme heat, particularly in the last trimester of their pregnancy, have a heightened risk of preterm delivery and even stillbirth. Getting back to the climate piece for a moment, I mentioned that we looked at three different scenarios for how our, um, 
how the planet could warm over the course of this century. These are based on three scenarios that we call the no action, slow action, and rapid action scenarios. And those are the red, yellow, and green lines here. Um, so in that no action scenario, our greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise through the end of the century. And on average, um, on Earth, we see about 7.7 .7 degrees of warming by the end of the century. In a slow action scenario, we are perhaps let our greenhouse gas emissions rise through the middle of the century and then rapidly decrease them thereafter. That would lead to a warming on Earth of about 4 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. And in a rapid action scenario, we quickly and aggressively reduce our carbon emissions and we're able to limit warming to about two degrees Celsius, which is a goal of the um, International Paris Agreement, which is about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll primarily be showing um, results of our study from that no action and the rapid action scenario, just to kind of bracket the two end members we saw. Okay, so when we look at what happens between historical conditions like we experience now in the middle of this century, we find that we would see steep increases in extreme heat. This is for that no action scenario. So for example, looking at a few cities in California, as I assume many of you will be coming from California as I am, um, we would see historically, um, if we look here in the, um, sorry, the upper left for a moment, these are, this is the average days per year with a heat index above 100 um, on the top row and average days per year with a heat index above 105 in the bottom row. Um, so as an example, in Sacramento, the capital of California, historically, they've experienced one day per year with a heat index above 105. By mid-century, that could rise to 13 days per year. Um, we see dramatic changes all over the U.S. such that parts of the country that have historically not experienced any extreme heat, um, such as Vermont, New Hampshire, start to see days with, over, with a heat index over 100 fairly regularly. If we look at cities experiencing a month or more with a heat index above 105, um, historically, there are only three cities in the country that have had these kinds of conditions. And you can see those in Southern California, right along the border with Arizona there in those um, somewhat target looking symbols. By mid-century, if we take no action to reduce our emissions, we would see about 150 cities countrywide that would experience 30 days or more with a heat index above 105. So looking at a very um, broad and widespread expansion of this dangerous level of heat. If we look to a late century time period, again with the no action scenario, and here the maps are showing days per year with a heat index above 105 on top, and with those off the charts conditions on the bottom, um, we see that much of the country would experience these um, um, extremely dangerous conditions, even 105 it can be dangerous in many places and for many people. Um, but we would see parts of Florida and Texas, Louisiana, having three to four months of those sorts of conditions. Um, and even places like Maine, um, parts of Washington state, experiencing these 105 degree heat index days fairly regularly. If we take a look again at the example of Sacramento in California, um, by late century with no action to reduce emissions, Sacramento would see 37 days per year with a heat index above 105. When we think about these off the charts conditions, like the map you see on the bottom here, historically these conditions have only happened in the Sonoran Desert in the US. So that's um, the zone where California and Arizona meet, extremely hot, dry desert conditions. But by late century with no action, about 60% of the country by area would start to see um, these off the charts conditions, even in an average year. The good news is that we don't have to continue down this path of no action to reduce our emissions. 
and that if we are able to take rapid action to reduce our emissions swiftly and aggressively, we're able to really uh, substantially limit the expansion of extreme heat. So here again, we're looking at cities that would experience 30 days or more with a heat index above 105 in the late century time period uh, with the no action scenario on the left and the rapid action scenario on the right. So you can see um, even just visually without knowing the numbers of cities that are on these maps, um, with that no action scenario, hundreds of cities would be affected um, with this level of extreme heat, as opposed to less than 100 if we take that rapid action and put ourselves onto a safer path. So what does that look like and what does that mean to be um, putting ourselves onto a safer path? Well, we know even if we take a look just at this last slide once again, even in that rapid action scenario, scenario, we would see an expansion of the places and the number of people who would be exposed to extreme heat, um, even in that relatively uh, optimistic scenario. So what that means is that in the coming decades, we're going to need to be both adapting to extreme heat conditions so that we're able to keep people safe from the heat that we know is coming down the pike. And we need to work on mitigating our greenhouse gas emissions so that we limit the amount of future heat that we experience. In terms of what it means to keep people safe, there are many, many things that communities can do and states can do, the federal government can encourage as well. These include things like heat early warning systems that alert the most vulnerable groups ahead of time that um, a heat wave is coming and that they need to um, take extra precautions. Um, states and communities could develop heat adaptation plans and emergency response plans. Um, public housing currently has heating standards in many places, but not necessarily cooling standards. So for people who have relatively few coping resources who are living in public housing, Getting such standards in place is really important. Um, communities can make investments in things like cooling infrastructure, trees, shading, cool roofs. Um, often some of our communities within urban areas that have historically not had a lot of resources um, also lack in things like trees. And so they, they tend to be hotter areas um, than the neighborhoods that have more resources and um, have historically been planting trees, and so they've grown into these, these nice shade um, trees. Um, bill assistance programs for low-income households are incredibly important. Um, already about one-third of Americans uh, say that they have trouble paying their utility bills in a given month. And so as the cost of running your air conditioner rises because it needs to be run more often, we need to be looking at programs that um, help people to stay safe in their homes so that they can con continue to stay cool. Um, investments in heat and climate smart infrastructure. And the final one here, reforming utility disconnect policies um, is one that I'll talk a little bit about in this next slide. But uh, right now in the US, many states have measures that prohibit utilities from disconnecting people's policies, even in cases of non-payment when it's extremely cold. But very few states have such policies in place that are tied to extreme heat. And as I mentioned, as air conditioning becomes more and more of a necessity, um, we need to be encouraging utilities to be taking a look at their um, heat disconnection policies. Just as one example of that, my colleagues and I last week um, looked at the intersection of a heat wave that was affecting Florida and COVID-19 cases in the state. So Florida was facing last weekend a heat index of over 100 in some parts of the state. Um, and as we shelter in place because of the coronavirus, we have more and more people needing to run their air conditioners at home. And at this point, Florida did not have a mandatory utility or a mandatory moratorium on utility disconnections. And so you find a lot of people um, having to be at home, unable to go to facilities like a, a cooling center or a movie theater or a library or a mall that's air conditioned. Um, 
and yet facing the prospect of having their utilities disconnected. Um, another area of focus for our organization is on keeping outdoor workers safe from extreme heat. Last year, um, a bill was introduced in the House called the Asuncion Valivia Heat Illness and Fatality Prevention Act. Um, it was named after a farm worker, in, farm worker in California who died of extreme heat exposure. Um, and so it's, it's somewhat to honor and recognize him and the, the challenges that face um, not just farm workers, but many workers in this country. Um, California and Washington are the the only two states in the country that have um, not just recommendations on how employers need to um, pr uh, protect workers in cases of extreme heat, but they're actually enforceable standards on the books. That's not the case at the national level. Um, it's not the case for most of our states. And so this act aims to, um, aims to give Congress the power to, to let OSHA direct those kinds of um, standards. So those were some of the adaptation uh, steps that we need to be taking to keep, being, to keep people safe in the face of extreme heat. At the same time, we also need to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, two of the largest sources of um, carbon emissions in our country and around the world are the electricity sector and our transportation sector. Um, we've seen incredible action on the part of many states in the country, California, um, New Mexico, New York, Massachusetts, have all come forward in recent uh, months um, with pledges to um, cut emissions really substantially between now and the middle of the century. So we need to start encouraging those kinds of actions at the national level. Um, we also need to be participating fully in international um, efforts to reduce fossil fuel use. Um, but just on a practical level, things like incentives for electric vehicles, investment in our, in our public transportation infrastructure can all help to start to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and the amount of warming we experience in the coming decades. Many of those actions we take to reduce our fossil fuel use have co-benefits in that they will, they will positively impact um, the health of many people. So this graph comes from a study done by my colleagues at UCS that looked at the exposure of different racial and ethnic groups in California to um, PM 2.5 air pollution. So this is the same type of air pollution we get during wildfires, but in this case, they were looking at particulate matter pollution coming specifically from vehicles. We can see that African American and Latino communities in California um, are disproportionately exposed to um, poor air quality due to vehicles. So as we think about transitioning to vehicles that run on electricity rather than gasoline, um, it's likely that we would see things like improved air quality that would translate into um, positive health outcomes for African-American and Latino groups. Our Killer Heat Report has a number of really great resources that you can find online at ucsusa.org slash killerheat. We have an interactive mapping tool where you can click on any county you want in the lower 48, and you'll, it'll bring up some information about how the frequency of extreme heat is projected to change under different scenarios. Um, we also have an interactive data widget where you could just type in your location, any city or county you want, um, hit go and get those same sorts of statistics. Um, if there's anyone who really wants to dig into the data, you can download all the spreadsheets. And we also have a lot of Spanish language materials. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the report, again, there's the the URL for the report itself. If you're interested in UCS just as an organization, we always, always encourage new memberships. Um, or if there are scientists in the audience, you can join our science network and um, get access to things like training for how to translate your science into um, public policy as well. So thank you very much.